I am your host, joined by my co-host, Timmy Long, and it's the fifth installment with the first guest, which is Sheila Conley from the Cork Alliance Centre. But we, before we get started with Sheila, um, a lot of you have been in touch during the last couple of weeks about how you'd like to contribute in some way. Um, there's two ways, really. If you want your business or your logo advertised on the podcast or you want to sponsor us in some way, get in touch. Um, go over to our Facebook page, Tunari's. Um, also, if you want to become a patron of the podcast, you can pledge the price of a cup of coffee to us or the cup of coffee. Um, and the link is in my Twitter, James Leonard 85 We've, up, up until now, we have five people that are patrons and they pledge between five and 20 euros. But if you haven't got it, that's okay too. Um, so do you want to drive around to him? Well, uh, Sheila Connolly is um, a lady that works for the Cork Alliance Centre, which is inside in town. Um, and they help people coming from prison, men and women. And we have her today as a guest. Mm. And I just want to introduce her. Sheila is also a very, very good friend of mine and James's and has helped us tremendously along our way in coming out of prison. She's helped us get courses and helped us with personal growth and well-being. So it's just very, 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 very good to have her here and yeah. to be able to have a chat with her. So how are you, Sheila? I'm very good to me. Thanks, Emil. Thank you. It's nerve wracking to be here, but like, it's so amazing. <laughs> Little did I know when we met years ago that we'd ever be sitting here or when we set up the Cork Alliance Centre that I'd have the pleasure of doing something like this. I know, it's amazing to think like that. Two, two fellas that was in the depths of addiction and prison. I know we can do our own podcast like this and I don't know, it's very empowering, you know, but yeah. the Cork Alliance gave us the platform really and helped us kind of believe in ourselves. Yeah. That's fair to say. Yeah, yeah. You know, we have very poor self-esteem and confidence and everything. So to be in this position is amazing. It just yeah. shows that, mm. you know, when you invest time in people, they can um, reach their potential, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's something that Sheila gave us, like she always always told us that we could you know be better than what we were you know there was another life there even when we couldn't really believe that ourselves yeah. she just kept pushing us and pushing us and putting different things in place for us when we needed say education or anything else in 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 my own journey i remember i needed a mindfulness class and sheila was there to help me there and that was fantastic. It, it really, yeah. really helped me. I remember you know, when I came out of treatment and I was um, planning on going to college and that mm. I did an application form. It was so yeah. daunting, you know, yeah. to play for Susie, yeah. to play to UCC. It was like, you know, yeah. um, basic stuff that I didn't have the skills to do. Yeah. And the cock lines was there. Yeah. And now I'm helping, you know, I've worked in yeah. jobs where I can do that as well, you know, so it's great. But mm. um, before the cock lines, you had an interest in life. Mm. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a little bit about your, your work in Africa? Well, yeah, I suppose I'm one of the few people that moved from South Sudan to Cork. Um, so I joined Concern but six, uh, after the genocide in Rwanda. So I spent um, five or six years working in the Great Lake re Lakes region, kind of between Rwanda, Zaire, that doesn't exist anymore, yeah. back into DRC, um, some time in Tanzania and Kenya, in South Sudan, and then also a bit of time in Southeast Asia as well, in Laos yeah. and Cambodia. War, war torn countries. Yeah. 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 Dif was, a different life. Was that uh, around the time that there was actually, like, there, were, there was war there when they were killing each other? There was, you know, I, there was a dictator there, wasn't there? I Hila? went into uh, Rwanda just after the genocide. So the genocide would have happened in 94, so I went in in 95. Yeah. Um, and I would have been, when war broke out in Zaire, I would have been there as the transition from Zaire into DRC. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose it would have been in Rwanda as well at yeah. that time, you know, on the co on the, the the southern border. Yeah, and you know, for people that don't know, can you explain what what that genocide was? It was a huge number of deaths yeah. in a very small period of time. I even to try and begin to explain it, it's a it's a very complex process. Um, but yeah, there was, and I suppose you're looking at a lot of upset. You're look, looking at a generational um, oppression. You're looking at control. You're looking at um, a lot of pieces of um, power and power imbalancement and um, then you know, with that comes come fractions and fraction within the community. Um, but I suppose the last set of genocide, the, the last form of the genocide in Rwanda, which was 25 years ago now, would have been um, 
there was it's such bred out of fear and a distrust and power and control and and um I suppose there was just so many messages and mixed messages um mm. of distrust mm. that it destroyed yeah. um a whole a whole a whole country destroyed a population it brought yeah. them to the edge um and amazingly they've been able to bring themselves back yeah and what you want to read is a is, couple of hundred thousand deaths in a couple of nights really yeah over space and and quite a physical death because of most of the, a lot of the killings were um by machete so it was very mm. hugely yeah. traumatic there was an awful like? lot of What's it like coming the, the from le- the legacy of that and the yeah. legacy of the of the people involved in it that, that fled the legacy of um, feeling you didn't have a choice in it mm. the legacy of the damage the legacy of the um, power and the control the legacy of your family being taken out altogether mm. in the process the fa- the legacy of you watching that happen yeah. the legacy of you knowing that it was your neighbours that were involved in it mm. there's untold legacies that yeah. um, that as a society. Um, you have to make amends and you have to come to terms with mm. um but first and foremost it was when i was there it was much more about a survival about yeah. um i know you talk about in relation to addiction if you're not alive you can't yeah, yeah. you can't do anything and it's, and it's the same within yeah. the rwandan context that unless you know we we, we need, needed to be able to support people to work to work through for themselves yeah did did that help you uh in terms of you know what happened over there sheila did did that kind of make you want to come home and help out the Irish people? It's uh, in, in what you're doing now in terms of helping people coming from prison and. Um, I, you know. I I don't know so much of that. Um, when I think for me there, I understood, I got a better understanding of man's inhumanity to man, yeah. and then man's humanity, mm. um, and what the greatness of people, what we can live with what we can survive, what we can do, um, what we can face and what forgiveness actually is. Um, and and, and how, what, what that feels like and what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, what, when you're looking at multiple traumas and traumas, repeated traumas over and over again, how do you survive that? Mm-hmm. And watching people survive that and watching them find their new way of being in that and watching the people who are there to support them to do that as well and see how that happens um yeah. you know it was a hugely empowering piece but it really for me i suppose it can make you not believe in humans at all and not mm. believe in goodness for me it was an absolute proof of goodness because i was there after i saw what people could do i saw how people could bring themselves back i saw the caring nature um of people and that i suppose it gave me a compassionate understanding of how you uh, you know how, how how you walk into how you find yourself in that space um yeah. and how ha- and how do you take your and the frightenness of that and how the, how powers from outside can control that and how you bring yeah. yourself back yeah. you got to see like the two polar opposites of what humans are capable of the ma- the yeah. massacres and then the goodness yeah so then when you come back to ireland after that experience um how did you end up working with prisoners <laughs> was it the jinx or was it um, I well, I came back from Sudan, and I would know I was kind of looking at where do I fit. Um, in a former life, prior to that, I was an accountant, so I was kind of going well, trying to see how how I fit back into Ireland. I know at the time when I left, I was told I wouldn't fit back in. Yeah. Um, well, there's a big difference between an accountant and a genocide and prisoners. Well, I suppose I would have had a lot of other work then with concern in, in yeah. various spaces as well with in, with. Um, various people yeah. um but i suppose the rwanda pieces it was a profound piece mm. but um i think for me the when i came back i was looking at kind of merging the business background that i had and the community background that i had and see see where those could marry yeah. and um at the same time the um what was business in the community um and is now iasio and uh, the probation service were looking for somebody to um set up an office in cork as a training employment office they already had a couple around the country um so i was employed as a training employment officer for cork um and was involved with probation so would have been in and out of the prisons would have worked with clients of probation yeah. to help them get into training and employment can you tell us what iasio is um iasio is the 
Irish, Irish Association, Association for the Social Integration of Offenders. Yes. I'm yes. going to say yes. that. <laughs> yes, there's a work. I don't, I don't work. <laughs> I didn't work experience there. So, uh, so you know. Um, but yeah, so it's about working alongside probation, the probation service to help get the clients of probation service into um, training and employment. Um, and I suppose when I was there, from I, I love the job, I love the work, um, and I also appreciated that there was more to it than just the job and just the work. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, the think tank in Cork, the Cork Alliance Centre, were looking at the revolving door um, within the prison service and looking at trying to, what could be do, done to change that, what could mm. be done to um, bring change in, knowing that it was a whole population and, and generations that were in this process and not able to break the cycle of it. And sought with the support of prison service and probation service, probation service in particular, to um, make a difference in that mm. endeavour. Yeah. So they, I applied for that position and yeah. got it. So I got, a, got an empty office and said, yeah. go do what you, you know, set, set up the project, get it working. Yeah. But I suppose because I had been in the linkage programme, I had met men and women who had said to me they'd wanted more, they'd wanted different. So I had people I could go and ask. Yeah. What do we need to do? How do we do it? What did that need to look like? How, what could, how would that feel? Mm. Um, and how could we best meet that? Yeah. Um, then the prison service facilitated by the probation service that is into the prisons to get access to people prior to release. Yeah. Um, start establishing relationships and the importance of those relationships. Yeah. Mm. Um, and what's the first, what was the first couple of years like? Was it hard to become established or was it hard to get into the prisons? Was it hard to get the lads to come in the door because I know it's a voluntary project as well. They're not sentenced, they say. They come because of their free will. Is it hard to get it up and running? Um, I think there was always challenges and there always will be challenges that because people don't, are, are, are wary of uh, and to trust and, yeah. and, and wary to believe. Um, but I think at the time, of, I suppose in Cork as well, we had two prisons. We had Spike yeah. and we had Cork prison. Um, our, our women were in Limerick prison predominantly, some of them were in Dublin, but mainly in Limerick. Um, and it was about, I suppose that's where the relationship comes into, it was about giving time. Um, it was about having champions within the prison um, service that were going to say, look, this person might need might need some help, this person mm. um, is looking for it. And then word of mouth will build that as well. So we would have had strong allegiances with the school and the education departments um, mm. within the prison with probation service and probation would make referrals into us because they were um, trying yeah. to support people as well. So it was looking at that wider aspect. Yeah. I remember my first time meeting you was up in the Midlands, yeah. And you going back to what James said there about trust, you know, I, you were already at that stage after developing trust amongst uh, men and women that were after being in prison in Cork. And I remember when I met you and you were just big smile in your face and, and I got a really good sense of hope from that, you know. Um, and that's when I really started connecting with the Cork Alliance from then on. And like, from I knew I had something when I came out of prison to, to help me get by. Um, for instance, you got me counselling when I came out as well, which was very, very important to me, you know, amongst other things that I was able to get off the, the Cork Alliance, you know, to help yeah. me on my journey, you know. So um, I think what was very, very important was for we to be established as an an agency that would be able to help yeah. prisoners, men and women. Mm. And once you were like you're there now, like, how long are you there, Sheila? At the moment, eighteen years. Eighteen years, like, and, yeah. and there's an awful lot of men and women after walking in. And I know quite a few of them yeah. that walked in your doors, you know, and, and they're still clean, sober today, and they're doing well. A lot of them have. Yeah went on to college and got educations yeah. like me, like James and, and like a lot of people we know, you know, what would you say to somebody that is only out of prison? You know, a lot of our, 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 our listeners would be people that have had tough times and would have been to prison and have addiction problems. Would, where would you be able to help them? Would you be able to help them to get education or anything if they were just looking for somewhere to go? I think to me the, the, those pieces of the education and the employment and the accommodation are, are kind of bums on seats pieces there that are 
the tangible pieces of things that also the area of work and we can support people in those and we've done that and we can support people I suppose it's not only get the course it's to stay on the course and to do it and follow through in it and understand you know work out if it what what the right one is for you but for me I suppose the wider piece of work that we would be doing would be all in that relationship would be helping people find themselves understand yeah. themselves understand their relationships with other people manage themselves in it how they're being in their addictions and um, what's happening in that process and I suppose I see our role as support workers being a much wider piece if somebody's in therapy they have one hour a week yeah. and there's an awful lot more other hours in the week mm. um, and and how do you manage that and how do, how do you regulate yourself within that when you're learning all these different ways of being when you're challenging yourself to as you said you know just literally move change change your friends, change you know, your people's places and things that invariably have changed all of that. Yeah. And then how are you in the world and how do you manage that? Yeah. And how do you keep the faith that this is worth trying? How do you think it through? How do you understand what's happening without having a safe and secure place to go, to be listened to, to be understood, to explore for yourself how you're feeling? And I suppose for me, that's what we do. I, I fully appreciate how difficult it is for people to come in the door and to come back and that's for me the absolute brilliance of, of yeah. every day and work for me is to watch somebody come back in the door a second time and a yeah. third time to pick up the phone that is an absolute pure gift because none of that is easy no. and to watch people do that and to believe and to try and i think that's one of the things that we see a lot and i suppose you, you the two of you have come across that i know as well is that piece of Belief that I'm going to try again and again and again, yeah. and maybe somebody's doing that over and over, but they still try that resilience, that brilliance yeah. in people to be able to tap into that and to be able to hold them when they're not able to hold themselves yeah. and to be able to provide a space where they can explore that and think that through for themselves is just an absolute gift. Yeah, no, when Timmy talks about his first interaction with the Cock of Ains, and mine was slightly different. Yeah. As I was thinking it was about 18 or 19, mm. and you know, um, when, when you're young and dumb and you think you've the world's you know, sorted out, but uh, there's a, the conversation on the air amongst 18, 19 year olds would be, they can't get you out to find them, do you know what I mean? <laughs> getting called by yeah. Cock of Ains, yeah, yeah, or yeah. decline that officer, they can't get me out. That was yeah. the way it was, yeah. you know? But, um, and I suppose for that, it's really important for me that we never got anybody out that because yeah. that would corrupt the relationship that we have. Yeah. That that wasn't my role to get somebody out. It was their own role to get themselves. Yeah. We tend to hand over our power so often yeah. to other people that for me, it's about instilling the power back in the person themselves for themselves to get themselves out, yeah. to take charge and take ownership of that rather than hand it over. Yeah. But I remember um, I used to meet with a uh, male at the start and then Vicky and, um, you know, I'd have nice conversations with them. And as I got a little bit older into my 20s, I probably had more, more mass in it. Mm. And I suppose I did, I did become sick of drugs and prison around 22, 23, 24, you know. Um, and I'd have conversations with Vicky and they'd go along the lines of, um, you're coming to the end now, blah, 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 using tablets. And I thought, I didn't know why I used tablets, you know. And I used to say to Vicky, I don't know why I use tablets. They just make me feel calm. They just they just slow down everything, make yeah, me feel calm. Yeah. And she used to try and instill a belief in me that you can actually get that calmness from something else other mm. than drugs. But and that was great and all. But when I come outside the gate, that mm, madness yeah. is just overwhelming. Yeah. And I suppose my care plan with Vicky was gone out the door as soon as I got on outside the prison gate. I'd say this is common for you to have plans and do lots of work pre-release, but then only to see them fall flat in their face afterwards. How does, how do you as a professional deal with that? And obviously the door is open all the time, you know, if, even if if I messed up with Vicky, the next sentence, Vicky was there again, you know what I mean? And the door was always left open, like, but I suppose it can be this happening for you as a staff member. Maybe I'm too long in the tooth, but it's not disheartening for me. <laughs> Um, I think it is understanding the relationship and it's the consistency of that person being there for you yeah. um, and being there in prison and out of prison. And even if that hasn't gone the way you hoped, hasn't gone the way you planned, but that you know if that relationship in prison has instilled in you at least the knowledge that I can still talk to her, I can stay, you know, I can pick up the phone, um, I can I can make my way through it yeah. at any stage. Um, 
yes fabulous if, if the plans work but as you say the huge pressure yeah. that's under people when you're in addiction and like it's very difficult to go straight from prison straight into treatment yeah. that has its own challenges yeah. within itself yeah. um, so invariably we are looking at time in the community mm. um, and we are looking at how we can make how that make that as strong as possible and how you can how you can support yourself yeah. um, in all of those pieces it was one of the things that you would you would have said at the conference that really resonated um, with the chief O'Keefe at the time was yeah. the, that piece of every contact counts yeah. and that your footprint on people's lives it, it is a very real piece and as officers they they have much more contact time with people and um, so they have much more power of influence if I go into a prison I go in for a couple of hours a week I might meet a couple of people it's a very small footprint yeah. whereas when a, when a prison officer is there for a 40 hour week or whatever yeah. that they they have much more of a footprint yeah. and I think that's where the training was coming at it going to understand the footprint, understand the people that you're working with, to give a different insight into what that could be, and um, yeah. the space to see what, what else you can do. That it's not just about locking people up. Mm. It, it's about that rehabilitation piece and how do we change things and how do we bring them, move everybody forward in that process. Mm. So yeah, they asked James and myself to come up and mm. be involved in prison officer training, which took yeah. time for us to get our heads around as well yeah. and. I remember when I was in the Midlands, I always looked at the prison officers and like, yeah, because they were in authority, I thought they were perfect, mm -hmm. you know, and I thought all figures of authority were perfect, that they they done no wrong and they had no problems with addictions and stuff like that. It wasn't until I went into the prison and it, all that perception changed for me because I seen that everybody else, prison officers, uh, the chaplains, everybody associated with the prison, you know, everybody had their own problems, yeah. you know. I, before that, I never, I thought it was just people like me were, the way, were societies, whatever you want to call it, messed up, you know. And then you had the likes of the guards, doctors, nurses, they didn't have any psychological mental health problems or yeah. anything like that. Like that was my kind of understanding of that. You know, so yeah. um, like well, it's almost like the uniform. If person was wearing the uniform, mm. it was like an abstract. It was like a symbolic figure that didn't have any kind of a personality. Mm. But then when you get chatting to a guard yeah. or a prison officer or a doctor or a teacher or whoever, yeah. you realize does that we actually have more in common than mm. we have differences. Yeah, and we all have the same issues. You know, mm. we all we're just trying to get on with our lives and be the best person we can be. Mm. You know, so we might think that because we're from this area and that from their area, we're doing this job and they're doing that job, but we're actually more alike than mm. we're different, you know? I actually, I was going to AA in the prison, you know, and believe it or not, one or two of them actually asked me about AA, asked me what I was doing, how I got help. And, and I'd say they may have had their own problems in their own lives with, with substances or alcohol or whatever it may have been, you know, and I would have given the advice. And, that's, do you know what, I respected those people a lot for that because they, they left, left me see the little softer side to them, you know, and that was fantastic to see, yeah. you know, and it showed me that we're all the same, there's no one different, it's just, yeah. it's just we had a different upbringing and whatever and, you know, we went down the wrong routes, you know. And, and I think, Timmy, it, the, one of the things we ask of people is to, to, to live an honest, yeah. open um, and we, and be, you know, be willing in your in your program, and unless your supports are prepared to do the same, mm. it's very difficult to establish that relationship. Mm. You know, and I think I I'd like to think that that's you know one of the pieces that we offer is that honesty, openness, and willingness to journey with people, um, as they as they as they bring the changes they need into their life. But that's about that connection, mm -hmm. and that's what you're talking about is that connection that you found with people. You know, made made that difference, opened up more opportunities. Yeah. freed you um, mm -hmm. in spaces that you didn't think you know, was possible to be free. Mm -hmm. Like I know you were talking earlier on about you know people not being in prison, mm -hmm. but I also know people at prison save their lives. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge piece. Of, and maybe it's an, a, a statement as to our society that, 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 that mm -hmm. they've had to find prison to save their lives yeah. rather than think find other places within our society yeah. to do it. Prison definitely saved my life once or twice, Sheila. I think there was mm -hmm. times when I went to that court and that judge gave me a custodial sentence out of mercy because yeah. of the way I presented 
frail, thin death door. Yeah. And he was like, give that man eight months. And he was like, give that man six months in prison and you'll regenerate, you know? Yeah. Um, but in lieu of other options, that was all that was there for him. So hopefully with this new policy going forward, that there might be a diversion scheme. But I suppose mm-hmm. it wouldn't be relevant for me anyway because it's only for two convictions. I could pick up those two convictions in a day and it doesn't work after that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, when, let's say, if you're working with somebody in prison, right, yeah. and they're, they're ready, they're ready to reintegrate back into society, what's the barriers they're facing when they get out? The main ones, let's say. Well, I think their main ones are going to be their people, places and things. I think accommodation is obviously going to be secure accommodation. But that's something that everybody faces in, in you know, whether, you know, it's exacerbated if you're coming from prison. But it is a real challenge for an awful lot of people. Um, and it's the security of knowing where you are. It's how do you break the ties with the older people in your life. I'd have so, some of the men I'm working with recently, currently are, you know, they've come out of prison and there's, there's other people coming looking for them. There's old acquaintances, old friends, um, you know, trying to establish their connections again and they're trying to work out how, how they, they travel that journey when they're, that's not what they want, when that's bringing different things into their lives um, and, and how to make that journey. They're, they're some of the bigger challenges that I suppose we can kind of think that we can just gloss over quite easily or you just don't talk to them. Yeah. But it's not that easy and it's not that easy if they're your family. It's not that easy to make those choices um, mm. and to consistently make those choices, especially if that leaves you in an isolated space because who else do you talk to then? How else do you associate? Mm. If, that has been your, if they have been your people, yeah. And your way of associating, you know, it's you're going to a different planet almost to try and create a new space to do that. Yeah. And I suppose you're coming into our centre to work that through, to work out what that looks like, to work to and to help identify and understand your own feelings around all of that, yeah. um, and then begin to explore ways of actually bringing other people into your life um, and widening out your network and widening out your supports, yeah. um, and then looking at. Um, you're asking people really to change your identity, Absolutely. your persona, leave your family and friends. I like I remember an early recovery when I came out of the treatment. I went into a house over in the Simon and I stayed away from some families and friends and the area and everything. I felt I was being so disloyal. Mm. I felt I was yeah. abandoning them. Yeah. I felt yeah. like, who do you think you are, James? Like, all oh, this, like, that's a very powerful thing if you're not ready. You know, so it's, it's about you can get through that part of early recovery mm. if you have the support you know but i can see why people fall back into it you know yeah give up yeah. your like even if the, if even if you're a drug user and you're in another prison and life is shit that's still your identity mm-hmm. do you know what i mean that's all we've known yeah no we know nothing else yeah. and then they go into something new that you don't know it totally it's, you don't know what it's, it's like it's, it's like landing on, yeah. on, it's like landing on a, a different planet and you know sometimes you're probably better off if you did because you'd be starting fresh you're in a different yeah. environment and you can be yourself you can be that person you always wanted to be you know but when you're going back into your natural environment you're you're supposed to be a certain way and and that's the way people want you to be and, and you know and it can be really really because i spoke about that in my one of the second part i was the first part going back into your 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 normal environment and trying to be somebody else mm. it's a really really difficult thing because it, it it's you you have to give a bit of yourself away you know i had to leave some of myself down, you know, that big macho ego. I had to drop that because I didn't want to be that person anymore. Or, or reformulate what that macho image actually is and what that strength actually is yeah. and what it is to be a man yeah. in all of that as opposed to what would have been the man you would have lived yeah. before. I don't think, I, I suppose I really strongly feel that, that nobody lets down who they are as a man, that nobody, you know, that has to change, you know, that that you let go of all that it's it your strength is shown in a different way mm. um and your resilience and your independence and your it, it's a strength of character it's a strength of being it's not it's not a, a strength in your fists mm-hmm. um, and it's a resolve and a, you know a, um i suppose it's it, you know it's a solidity in yourself mm-hmm. that that people are seeking that i see people transition into yeah. um but none of that is easy no. None of that is easy. Like the number of men that I would met over the years, it's like you can't go into town without fighting. No. You just—it's just not possible to not fight when you're in town, no. and to actually support them to think that through, to transition through it, 
to to explore that and you know a number of months later they're going can't I ever imagine fighting in town I can't imagine how that would happen to you and you're looking then at what you're putting out and what you're bringing back into the world mm. um, and, and having the space and the trust in somebody to have mm. those conversations and to mm. think it through yeah. it's it's a big piece of work yeah. and there, it's pieces of work that you carry on day in and day out and you go outside of the office and you're putting it into practice and you're coming back in they're not all once-off decisions mm. they're a life-changing piece that you're living every single day and practicing every day and it depends on other people doing it as well to work out for you to work out how you do that dance with others mm. depending on where they're at um and so it's a lot of time sorry. and a lot there, i was just going to i was just going to ask what are the barriers do you think are there for people coming from prison like um in terms of education in terms of jobs you know what barriers have you come across in the cock lines a lot of the people you see what what kind of barriers do they come across? I think a lot of people have left school early, haven't mm. ha or haven't been able to access and um, the education that they would want for themselves or they they would want for their children. Mm -hmm. And I'd always say that if you if you want something for your children, why don't you want it for yourself? Mm. And what are you missing out? You know, and how can you give that to yourself as an adult when you maybe didn't get it as a child? And mm -hmm. um, so I think the education piece is a is a huge component for people and it's enough and for yourselves as well when you talk about it is building confidence yeah. and widening your your knowledge base and feeling creating a new identity it's part of your new identity mm. it's, it's a means of losing um that prison persona to become who you are through your yeah. education and who you are through your employment um i think one of the big pieces we fear find especially when people are working moving into the um, youth work into the drugs work and that, that we have you know with the with guard the vetting we have um concerns for people and because and i suppose there can be a misunderstanding that you know with the difference between guard the vetting and guard the clearance and that it's it's a statement of of convictions that people have but it doesn't necessarily hold you back mm. um from from any form of employment mm. um it's based on you know, informing your employer what was in your past, but but then it's your it's your space yeah. to, to to identify what you have done in your present, mm. and I would hope that our society is moving more to understanding where people are at in their present, yeah. um, rather than judging on the the distant past yeah. in relation to it. But I think we can also carry a lot of fear about somebody else saying, you know, if I'm not disclosing something to an employer, if I haven't told him that I was in prison. If even, even if I'm on the building site, maybe it's not so much there. But even in that scenario, mm. am I waiting for the next person to come in and point the finger and say, well, you do know he was there or she mm. was there? Yeah. Um, and that's a big fear. And I think we're back into the honest program that if you're living in an honest program, it's very difficult to do that. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it's asking a lot of people. And I suppose I'd often wonder, you know, who, who are we protecting in all that? Are we protecting ourselves or are we protecting the other person? The spent convictions bit is, you know, is that minding the rest of society? They, you don't have to tell them so they don't have to feel uncomfortable about mm. things as opposed to go, OK, I hear where you were at and I see and hear where you're at today. Um, and, I, and I'm engaging with who you are today um, so, and understand that that journey there was much more for you mm. than it was for somebody else. So if you had to say, if, if we have a few listeners here, um, and they have companies and they want to employ people and say somebody comes up to them and they've been to prison but they've changed their lives what would you say to one of those employers would you would you what would you say would you tell them they give them a chance or i i'd say to them what other, other employers yeah. have said to me what other employers have said to me is i don't know who else i'm getting he's mm. been honest mm. he's been truthful yeah. that that's worth its weight in gold as long as he can do the job and i know that that he's being honest with me what more can i ask of somebody um, and as that trust does come back not everybody in the business needs to know it can just be some um but i think i think that the honesty um is something that people have challenged channeled into their lives it's something they've welcomed into their lives it's a code that people are living by so i think we need to bring it into our employment and name it and own it yeah um, and, and and own it with um, and, and I'm not talking about pride in what your past life was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, and I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's a shifting of the shame, mm -hmm. I think is more where we're at rather than a pride, yeah. if that makes sense. I think as well, um, in terms of the point you made there, mm -hmm. you know, when you've somebody that has been through a lot of hardship like that and they've been in 
addiction in prison, obviously their life was very bad. But if they if they build themselves up so much to help yourselves and others, mm. and they get themselves in a position where they're actually at an interview, yeah. or they're being, you know, they're, 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 they're a candidate for a job, what you're getting there is a very resilient person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Somebody that has ability to make long-term goals and short-term goals, hit targets. Of, uh, a lot of the time you'll, send, you'll sense as well that when somebody is getting an opportunity, they'll be so loyal for that opportunity. Mm. And I know like if I've ever been given an opportunity, like I was given with Cox Simon, like I given with ETV, yeah. I have first loyalty to them organisations, mm. you know, and I work so hard for them organisation and I make sure my manager knows that I'm the right person for the job and I'm so grateful for the opportunity. That's what you get when you apply somebody who's been in prison yeah. or somebody with convictions. A gratitude and a loyalty and a, a work ethic that you mm. might not get with somebody that hasn't had that colourful yeah. background. Yeah, yeah. And I think to me, when you ask about what are the challenges that people face, one of the challenges that are faced is the addiction. That most of the people we know in prison have addictions and poly addictions. Mm. But when you look at that from an employment pl- point of view, and you look at somebody in recovery, and you work at somebody, who, look at somebody who's done a twelve-step program. Mm-hmm. You know, there you have got a very solid, stable person that you know has done an awful lot of personal growth and development on top of the education piece that that they're bringing towards the job it's that's a strength it's not a weakness recovery is a strength and we might need to retrain that in a society but recovery is a strength yeah yeah and i you know you were touching on education there earlier on i know for me to know when we were talking about having the identity of the offender the drug Mm. user you know when you take that away it's like there's a void there and how do you find meaning in Mm. early recovery and I found it in education, and Timmy found it in education, mm. but some of our friends find it in employment, they find it working on building sites, they yeah. find it in having children, and it's, you or have to, Social activities, yeah. or they find it it's in, like it's not in health and fitness, or yeah. what, in whatever works for them, yeah. it's in music, it's in songwriting, in exactly. whatever, whatever it is. But you can that, only find that out. you get passionate about. Yeah, yeah. you can only, f- your yeah. You can only yeah. find your niche by having no experiences, and I think a healthy sign of growth is taking healthy risks or calculated risks, mm. trying new things, meeting new people. I think that's the beauty of recovery, you know, because in especially in the rooms, um, there is a diverse group, you know. But um, yeah, it's about finding meaning. And thankfully, I found my meaning, you found mm. meaning, and even this podcast, just another another yeah. kind of project, you know what I mean? Yeah. But you'll find your niche, mm. you know. I so think, I think by not doing, that's the failure. Exactly, exactly. And like when you, um, when you go and try new things, where do you end up in the same place all the time? You keep repeating the same cycle. Yeah. Do you know you get yeah. nowhere. And it's not because we're twenty or we're thirty or we're forty that we should know where we're going or what we want to do. Exactly. You've seen the meanders in my career path. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, I found my home now, when I found my home in Cork Alliance. Most yeah. definitely, like it is my passion and my mm. absolute joy to go to work in the morning. Yeah. Mm. That's fantastic. To have a job <laughs> I definitely, well, without a shadow of a doubt, have the best job in Cork. Yeah. You know, to watch people be part of that change process, to allow for people to allow you into their lives. Yeah. You know, to have the courage to pick up the phone to you. Um, you know, and and just chat and get and help bring that change in. Mm-hmm. There, there isn't a bigger gift, but it is about th- that action doing something, but finding something that you that that you can get passionate about yeah. that that distri- that can make life worth living. You know, over the last few weeks, we've had a lot of parents and loved ones that have people in addiction, um, and they're really struggling. Um, do you think everybody has the capacity to change? Yes. And have you ever worked with somebody that you thought there was no hope for them? No, I can't. I can't do that. I can't be in a space with no hope. Not not in our office when there is so much. Yeah. When every single day. I see something that 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 has given me hope, or I watch somebody do something that I that blows my mind. I didn't think that you know, th- 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 it was it was a, a big ask, and they were able to stand up to the mark. So absolutely, yeah, you know, I think it's, it's right. a it's a hair's breadth away from everybody. And if somebody's yeah. not able to hold the hope for themselves, it's my job to hold the hope yeah. with them, to support them, to hold it, and to find it. Yeah, like it's a job where you have full of hope, hope and gratitude because we see it every day. Yeah. And like we always go back to saying, as long as you're alive, yeah. there's there's hope. There's yeah. always hope. Keep yourself above ground. Don't ever give up. Sometimes you need the drugs to get mm. you through the hard times. I agree. When Definitely, you're, yeah. It's better than suicide. Whatever you do, don't commit suicide mm. because there's no hope then. 
you keep yourself alive, the penny will drop eventually. And when you're ready, for anybody who's been in the prison, they can yeah. contact you. Yeah. They can contact you through us. Yeah. Um, and There's it, a link in the website. Exactly. There's a link to the Cork uh, Alliance. There'll yeah. be a phone number on the website as well for the Cork Alliance. And all you have to do really is pick the phone up, ring them and walk in the door and you'll get whatever help you need. Yeah. So, and, if, and I'm if, sure and she will. Answer, yeah. We'll help you find it. Yeah. yeah. It's I. I don't have to be the guru. I don't have to be the person that knows all the answers. But I do have to be the person that's help, that's there to help you walk the walk to try and find them for yourself. Yeah. Um. And to get those supports and be that those supports that will say there's no point right. in me helping somebody try somebody helping somebody try to find accommodation mm. in this day and age. I'm going to go to the focus areas. I'm going to go to the access housings to bring that support in yeah. with mm. their expertise in. The space rather than us Excellent. double job on people there's no point in any of us double jobbing mm-hmm. there's enough work there and um, in in the space that we have our have our best skill base yeah. mm-hmm. to move it forward so anybody can change um and i think that brings us to a natural end <laughs> thank you so much for coming on you're thank our you. first thank guest you very much. Thank we're you. honored to have you it's been great talking to you hopefully the people at home um is after getting something from it um if you have been to prison or you know somebody's been to prison and they need some help Contact Sheila, contact us if you don't know how to get to her. Um, and look, we thank you again for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, share, retweet, do all that stuff. Um, and we'll see you again next week where we have Dr. Sharon Lambert, psychologist from UCC. So from me, James, and from Kimmy, God bless, and I'll see you next week. Thank you. This episode is sponsored by local entrepreneur Danny O'Donovan of quickminutes.com. Quick Minutes is a specialized meeting management application that streamlines the administrative process in running a meeting.